Welcome to worship this morning on this last Sunday of June. Um, we're delighted to have you join us for this time of praise, for reflection, for celebration, for uh, transformation by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So welcome. If you'll join with me now for the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace through God, through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from within the 89th Psalm. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your steadfast love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens, and I have made a covenant with my chosen one. 
I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength, and by your favor our might is exalted. Truly, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday according to St. Matthew from within the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Beginning at verse 40. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This for us today in our presence is the Holy Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to Christ. Well, as I sit here in my truck in the church parking lot just next to my office, I greet you, fellow siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you this day and always. From God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So why this sermon from the parking lot inside my truck? I'm going to get to that because this message to you today starts way back some 13 years ago where shortly after turning 30, I began my ministry as an ordained pastor at a very small church in rural Washington state. In the first couple of months of that call, I intentionally chose to devote nearly all of my weekday office time to visiting the small roster of homes listed in the church's records, whether they were still active members or not. I would begin with a phone call, asking them if they would mind if I got into my car and come by so for some time to get to know one another better. Sometimes that offer was met with great enthusiasm. Other times, not so much. And other times, just flatly rejected. But then there were also times where I had experiences very similar to the one I first had with Virgil. Virgil was not really interested in visiting with me, but not wanting to seem offensive, he said it would be okay. So I took a chance and I came by and we talked for a couple of hours. Eventually the conversation turned to Virgil's lack of connection to the church. Being up front, Virgil told me of his struggles with his faith and how he was not really sure what he believed anymore. He told me all of his objections to what he described as organized religion and how he had been let down or even hurt by churches in the past and how he had since given up on prayer. And I sat there listening and I just took in Virgil's doubt and pain like a sponge that had been thrown into a lake. Eventually, when the time came for me to leave, I told Virgil that I would pray for him and his struggles, and that Jesus, whether he believed it or not, would always be there for him if he ever wanted to try praying again. Virgil thanked me, but made it clear that he wasn't interested. I got in my car, drove back to church in the rain, as it's now kind of starting to rain today, and I sat in the parking lot just like I am right now. Only 13 years ago, I was sitting in my car and I was crying. I was crying because I was feeling like a failure. And I felt that way for a long time. With Virgil deep in my mind and anchored to my soul. 
I eventually shared this experience with Father Michael. Now, Father Michael was a seasoned Episcopal priest at a nearby parish who I came to enjoy and respect as a friend and as a mentor in ministry. He was a disciple who had been shepherding much longer than I had. And Father Michael shared with me words that are still very, very important in the world of faith that we experience today, fellow disciples. A world that we experience beyond this parking lot. Michael noted that we are such a results-driven people. Not only do we want results, we want results quickly. And because we are an instant results-driven people, what we often perceive as failure is really nothing of the sort. When any of us summon the courage to risk telling anyone about Jesus, we are really only expecting two immediate responses. Complete and utter rejection or immediate acceptance and enthusiasm for the message that we are revealing to them. Almost as if we are the ones who are going to make this person into a Christian disciple. As if it all hinges on our tenacity and our persuasiveness. Father Michael said to me, if rejection is the response, then we know that further conversation at this point will probably do more harm than good. And when the response is immediate acceptance, then we rejoice in our victory. And with equal enthusiasm, we begin feeding to those people worship times and locations. So there are two responses to our efforts at witnessing to the gospel. And two obvious responses to those efforts, right? No. I felt like a sponge again. This time, eagerly taking in truth and hope, rather than just doubt and pain. I learned then, and there, something from this wily old Episcopalian, something that I hadn't yet learned from either my Jesuit Catholic-led studies of sacred scripture, or my Lutheran seminary coursework and contextual internship. See, Father Michael taught me that there is, in fact, a third response to our efforts as disciples. But it is a response that we are, in a way, least comfortable with. It's what he liked to imagine that Jesus might refer to as the cup of cold water. And ironically... It's the response that has the potential to remind us more than the other two responses that it is in fact God, not us, who will bring a person to faith. In Matthew 10, from where the very brief reading of our gospel today is recalled, Jesus is preparing to send the 12 disciples out into the world. Not from a parking lot, but you get the image. He is bestowing upon them the authority to heal the sick and to drive demons out of the possessed. He is instructing them not to take any extra clothing or food with them, as they will be looked well after by what is called the people of peace, whom they will encounter in their journeys. And Jesus is also warning them to expect persecution, but he's saying that while at the same time comforting them with the assurance of the Holy Spirit's presence as they go out on their way. Jesus is revealing to them in very plain language what it takes to be his disciple and that they can expect to unleash chaos as families and friends turn on each other over the truth of the gospel. But then Jesus also reveals to the disciples what they can expect as they encounter those people of peace. He says, those who welcome you are really welcoming me, and by extension, God the Father. Imagine that. Those people of peace, as they welcome the disciples for who they are and for who they represent, 
they will receive their reward, their inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, and by the way, says Jesus, even if someone gives you, my little ones, so much as a cup of cold water, then that someone will likewise not lose their reward. Jesus knows that the disciples are going to face more than their fair share of outright rejection. People who, in a best case scenario, will simply reject the free gift of Jesus' salvation promise with a smug wave of the hand. He also knows that there's going to be more than that. That they will encounter people of peace. The ones who will open their hearts and homes to them. These people of peace, they will invite them in and they will attend to their every need. They will hang on every word that the disciples will have to say about Jesus and the gospel message. Jesus also knows that not everyone whom the disciples will encounter will fit into one of these two categories. The disciples will also encounter those who will welcome them in a lukewarm, obligatory, not wanting to offend sort of way. And perhaps the hospitality granted them will consist of nothing more than that cup of cold water. These folks, well, they may listen to the gospel message in a detached, unenthusiastic, or even resistant, scarred kind of way. But the fact that the disciples are not outright rejected means that they are at least willing to listen, even if it's only to be polite. Perhaps these folks will not respond immediately. But the offer of the cold cup of water means that they are at least not hostile to the disciples, nor are they completely hardened to the possibilities of faith in Jesus Christ. Perhaps they simply need some time. Some time of quiet reflection before being willing to explore the gospel further. Perhaps as the words of the disciples mill around in their heads and the Holy Spirit begins to work in their heart, the walls around their hearts will drop just long enough to allow a seed or two of faith to take root. What the disciples need to realize then, what I needed to learn from God talking to me through Father Michael, and what we all need to remember now, is that the disciple may end up never witnessing the transformation of those who we share the gospel with, those who we meet outside of this parking lot. And so we may not have the opportunity to share in their joy. And just as important for all disciples to keep in mind is that we are not going to save anyone. Our mission is to deliver the message of hope. The Holy Spirit who accompanies us on our mission as we enter the mission field the Holy Spirit of God will continue to do the work of salvation. As I look out at just the nearest realms of this mission field, it's not hard to see that as our society grows increasingly secularized and polarized these days, we as Christian disciples are more and more likely to encounter those who will at least give us a cup of cold water. There are certainly those out there. There are those out there that will respond to our efforts with some measure of hostility. And most, if not all of us, have experienced that. And most, if not all of us, have also experienced the joy of bringing the hope of the gospel to someone who desperately needed to hear it in that moment. And I think what we really fear today are those whose eyes glaze over 
and facial expressions morph into a neutral sort of detached look that communicates to us that we are probably wasting our time. Not so fast, Jesus says. They can hear us. They can understand the words that we are saying. And many cannot help but at least think about the words of the gospel message long after we are back here in our cars. I didn't change Virgil that day. A week after that day, God changed me as a rookie pastor that still had some important things to learn about discipling and the value of water in faith, not just the water we use in holy baptisms. Virgil did have two middle school aged kids though, two kids that he did choose to enroll in the confirmation program in that small little rural church. Many of us never see the results of our encounters with those who offer us a cold cup of water. But Jesus reveals to us that the sharing of the gospel with them, it's never a waste of time. It wasn't a waste of time for me. And I pray that this has been a holy and inspiring time for you today. For your continued journey as a Christian disciple, and as a follower of Jesus, I say, thanks be to God. Amen. Caught into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, or abandoned especially all those we mention to you now silently in our hearts. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you gather in your embrace all who have died. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing love, now flowing down.
to the world, inspired by the extravagant love of God. Live generously with open hands, loving one another as if your lives depended on it. Be good stewards of the gifts you have received so that God may be glorified in all that you say and do. And may the abundant love of God surround you. May the extravagant grace of Jesus Christ sustain you. And may the constant presence of the Holy Spirit encourage and inspire you in every good deed and word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh! 